Good morning. The Committee on Children and Families will now come to order. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Chairman Coleman. Here. Vice Chair Bailey. Here. Representatives Engel. Here. Dogan. Here. Hannigan. Here. Patterson. Here. Peitzman. Shields. Unsicker. Here. Young. Here. You have eight present. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, quorum has been established. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I just procedurally want to go over a couple of things as we're getting started. We're going to go into executive session to vote on a couple of bills. And then after that, we're going to start to hear testimony on the bills that you've come here to testify on. Everyone needs to fill out a witness form and have it signed prior to coming to, um, to testify. And we're going to see how many people are here to testify to try to limit our testimony. Um, three to four minutes per person. We've got a lot of people who are here and want to make sure. Um, so with that, I'd like to move into executive session. Madam Secretary. On House Bill 76. Any discussion from the committee on House Bill 76? Seeing none, I move that House Bill 76 be voted due pass. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Chairman Coleman. Aye. Vice Chair Bailey. Aye. Representatives Engel. Aye. Dogan. Aye. Hannigan. Aye. Patterson. Aye. Heitzman. Shields. Unsicker. Aye. Young. I now move that House Bill 76 be voted due pass by consent. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Chairman Coleman. Aye. Vice Chair Bailey. Aye. Representatives Engel. Aye. Dogan. Aye. Hannigan. Aye. Patterson. Aye. Peitzman. Shields. Unsicker. Aye. Young. Eight ayes and no noes. By your vote of eight ayes and no noes, House Bill 76 has voted due pass by consent. That will end executive session on House Bill 76. At this time, we'll move into executive session of House Bill 432. I move that House Bill 4, excuse me, 432 be voted due pass. Any discussion? I just would like the committee to note that the sponsor is still working with some interested parties on making sure that this language is as tight as possible and affects, um, has the intended effect. But in the interest of continuing to move it forward, I'd ask that the committee vote this out with the commitment from the bill sponsor that she's working with um, interested parties to make sure that we're able to get this ready for the floor. Any discussion? Seeing now. Chairman Coleman. Aye. Vice Chair Bailey. Aye. Representatives Engel. Aye. Dogan. Aye. Hannigan. Aye. Patterson. Aye. Peitzman. Shields. Unsicker. Aye. Young. Aye. You have eight ayes and no noes. By your vote of eight ayes and no noes, House Bill 432 has passed. This will close the executive session. Thank you, representatives, for being here. At this time, Representative Veet and Representative Engel, if you'd please come forward to hear House Bill 557 and 560. Whenever you're ready, you may proceed. Madam Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Rudy Beat. I'm from 100, or excuse me, from 59th District, and we are here today, and I'm here along with Representative Engel uh, to introduce to you a bill, 557 and 560, and I will give you a little history of where it begins. This has to do with residential care facilities that. Uh, alleged or, or state they are religious 
And under present law, that means these are children, homes for children from 18 and under, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. And under our present statute, there can be no regulations. We cannot require background checks. There can be no inspections. There's no health requirements, no safety requirements. And it's purely a blanket that they have these homes with absolutely no supervision, merely by stating they are religious. And it does not allow the state to see what the religious organization or that is supporting them. It's a mere statement saying, I am religious. I can do no wrong. Representative Veet, I apologize for interrupting you. I'm getting a text message that you're hard to hear on the recording. Do you mind removing your mask or moving the microphone closer to you? No, I have had COVID, so I should be fairly safe for the time being. Thank you, Representative. But it's important that right now the law says if they state they're religious, they can operate these homes with children in them 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, with no supervision or no oversight. Uh, I will have Representative Engel has been involved in this, and this is kind of a joint bill. Our bills are identical because this is not a Republican issue or Democrat issue. This is an issue that needs to be addressed. And I and uh, I then will go through with you what the bill we have uh, drafted. Uh, Kerry will talk about the the, uh, the the facts of what how bad some of these situations are, and it's important that everyone understand. Representative Ingo or myself, we're not against faith-based organizations or faith-based homes. We truly believe that faith can change a lot of things that medicine alone cannot change and can make these people and help these children adopt in life better than medicine alone can. So we are strong supporters of them. And this bill actually enables them to exist. It means that they will exist, but be, be uh, we will know they exist. And the important thing of it is if we don't do something, the bad apples or those who, who conduct these homes wrong are going to eliminate the good ones from being in existence also. With that, I will I would turn this over to Representative Bingo, who has worked very hard on this bill and started it before I did. Thank you, Representative Veet. Um, can you hear me okay? I can. I can. My hope is that I, I could hear Representative Veet as well, that I won't get a notice from somebody. Okay. I think for some reason, some people's voices carry with a okay. mask better than others. Um, I want to start by saying that this was brought to my, for those of you who are unaware of my background, I have a rather lengthy history in child welfare. Um, I am a, a licensed social worker. Um, I became aware of this issue, this concern, in September of this last year um, due to a series of investigative articles done by the Kansas City Star involving a particular facility. It be, I became quickly aware that this was not an isolated incident, incident, that this was systemic, or that it could appear to be systemic. Um, the amount of, uh, as soon as I, I stated that I was interested in it, I received an influx of emails and phone calls from survivors of, of abuse and neglect from across the country who had been here in Missouri. So these, these once children were labeled as troubled troubled teens, troubled kids. They had had behavioral issues in their homes and their parents or their caretakers had sent them to a facility in Missouri to hopefully get them help, to get them better so they could come back. But what happened when they were in these homes is that they were abused. They were physically abused, they were denied food, they were denied water, they were taken off their medications, they were not given medical treatment, um, they were sexually abused. Um, they were absolutely neglected and abused in every way, and there was no one looking out for them. So, so oftentimes, they would run away, and when they engaged with law enforcement, law enforcement would take them back to the facilities where the, the facilitators would say, well, these children are liars. This didn't really happen. They're bad kids. And I'm here to tell you in my professional experience that when you label a kid as troubled or bad, people tend to not believe them, which makes them even more likely to be victimized because you've already set up that these are bad kids. And so no one's gonna believe them when they're abused. And so it makes them more likely to be repeatedly abused. And so the trauma that, that these survivors experienced um, continually, I mean, they're still dealing with it today. One of the things that was most concerning to me when, when this problem was brought to me is that we have no way 
the state has an absolutely zero way of knowing that these facilities are in, in existence. As the current law states, I could have, I could have, I could have one of these facilities in my basement with unlimited children right now with zero regulation from the state at all. And we don't know about the existence of these facilities until unfortunately when something bad happens. And there's nothing more important than us protecting the children in the state of Missouri. And this is something that we can do. This bill that we've, we've drafted along with a series of advocates and survivors and agencies, um, hopefully we'll start addressing that issue. And I wanna reiterate what uh, Representative Veet said, that we are both strong proponents of faith and that faith has the power to change people, but faith can't be used as an excuse to abuse and neglect children. And so that's why we're here today. So I'm gonna let Representative Veet to the next section. For those of you on the committee that were on the committee last year, there was a four hour hearing here in front of you with a large amount of testimony of what went on. And from that committee, there was a recommendation made of guidelines that they wanted changed. That was submitted to us and we sat down and looked at those guidelines and tried to draft a bill to address most of those issues. We have a lot of people here willing to come in here today to testify from the state of Washington, California, New Mexico, and so I, I want to give them the opportunity so I won't go too in detail on the bill, but if you look at it, we did follow the, the guidelines that they recommended. The very first part of the bill gives us a right to go into circuit court if we want to have eyes on the children. So if we need to go in and talk to some child, particular child, we can go into court and get a subpoena to do that and they have to produce them. That's important because we have to be able to talk to children. Uh, it allows for an ex parte subpoena, but you also have to give them the opportunity to be heard. The next section we talked about was the notification area and what all they have to give us. We need information to know who's operating, where they're operating, uh, and the important parts we were getting into, we call this the Residential Care, Residential Care Facility Notification Act. We're not putting licensing on, but we do need to know they exist and, and the ability to investigate them if something comes up. Uh, I set forth what all they have to do with registering and, and the requirements of that. We uh, wanted to get into, make sure to do criminal background checks. I mean, that just floors me. And, I, and if you watch, if you listen to this, what's in the bill, there's not one thing we're asking them to do that a good business person would not do. Not any, I don't care if you're a religious facility or not, you would do these things. A background check, penalties if you don't do it, and how often they have to do them. Uh, and we followed the same background as they have a background check that they use for other state agencies. So we took the language right from those. Uh, we list what, what's all on the background check that would disqualify them. We require that they file uh, a safety inspection and a fire inspection. That's not, you know, you, you want a basic inspection done. Uh, we have provisions in there as to who can bring the charges. We have one situation that in a county, the deputy sheriffs were working for the home and everybody, the prosecutor was not too excited about filing any charges, so this actually gives the Department of Social Services the ability, if if they want, to ask the Attorney General to come in. There were there were recommendations in the in the in the report of November about setting up a website. We we discussed that if you have a particular website and we put various things on it, that creates a due process hearing. That would make it very expensive. We do have a website though, and that website direction to other websites that the state has for people who are wanting to investigate these homes to see if they're safe or not. You will notice, I think, the financial uh, uh, report on this was like 180000 which is very cheap for something this ma of this magnitude. We, we did that by using other state agencies and, and farms to uh, provide information to people who are checking out on these homes. If they go to our website, it will list those homes that are, that are on, not have given us notification, but it will not list, you know, derogatory things or positive things where we create a whole, whole, whole appeal process. We did not, that would create an un, unusual burden and there's a way to already accomplish that by using the existing system. 
And basically, that's, the, that's really all we're asking. And we do have a provision, I guess I didn't point out, that says, that's very important, I didn't highlight that. Nothing in the statute of Missouri shall give any government agency or jurisdiction authority to regulate or attempt to regulate, control, or influence the form, manner, or content of the religious curriculum, program, or ministry of the school or facility sponsored by a church or religious organization. Specifically, say, stay out of their business and make sure the kids are properly treated is the goal of this. And there are those, I will tell you, this is not, has not went as far as some of them wanted me to draft it. It's a little further than others want. It's a, it's a, a background where I think it gives us at least a start on watching what's going on, and hopefully that will be the end that's needed. Keep in mind, Missouri is the only two states have allowed this allowance that there's no supervision, Missouri and South Carolina. And you can imagine then people who want to come to Missouri that are chased out of other states come here and set up. And, and this, these not, the fees can run anywhere from Twenty-five to fifty, sixty thousand a year. This is not people who are, you know, paying two and three hundred dollars a month. So, right now we are the go-to place if you want to run a facility unregulated and do un and do unchristian or unreligious type activity. Thank you. Thank you, representatives. I would ask the committee if we can hold our questions. We'll have the representatives come back to close. There's witnesses that are trying to catch flights, and so as long as there's no objections to that, we'll go ahead and move forward into testimony and support. Just a reminder, if you'll come forward, make sure that you introduce yourself, say your name, and make sure you have your witness um, statement or filled out and signed. Thank you. Please proceed when you're ready. Good morning. Uh, my name is Colton Schrag. I'm from New Mexico. Um, I am in support of House Bill 557 and 560. Uh, I attended Agape Boarding School from 2006 to 2010. Uh, April, April 20th, 2007, approximately about 11.30 at night, me and three other boys were drug out of the dorm and, uh, and jumped by four staff members in the hallway because we were uh, talking about taking over the school. Uh, it never happened, it didn't happen, but I didn't get restrained properly at all. I was punched in the face several times and then kicked in the ribs. Uh, a few months later, we had a kid attempt to hang himself in the bunk beds, tied his shoelaces and a bathrobe around his neck, knowing that in the morning when he didn't get out of bed, staff members gonna walk through and dump his mattress, causing him to hang, and that's exactly what happened. I watched that man hang. Uh, and instead of getting him counseling, he was restrained for it. He never saw medical help or anything. Um, I can go on and on for st stories like this. Um, I, I would like to say that, that I am a Christian and I, I work in a youth group. Um, so I, I, I do not support anything that causes the state or any government to come into a religious facility and attempt to take over and control what they're doing. But I do not support any religious facility or any state-run facility that abuses kids and that allows it to go on. Um, I spent three and a half years in Missouri and in that three and a half years, I was, I was beaten, assaulted, starved, and uh, several other things. I've seen kids come in morbidly obese and without a doctor or any medical professional telling that person, hey, you need to be on a strict diet to lose weight. Staff members at Agape Boarding School decided that they were the doctor and said, you need to be on salad diets and you're gonna work out for three months until you lose enough weight till we deem you necessary to eat proper food and go to school. Um, that's not right. Uh, I don't know if you know the name Cornelius Frederick. That kid died last year in North Dakota in a state-run facility where there is regulations. I don't know how a kid has not died in your state in these schools that exist, because I can list three schools, Masters Ranch, uh, Legacy Boys Academy, Agape Boarding School, Circle of Hope, where I was abused by all four of those staff members that worked at Agape and eventually left and started their own school here. Um, there are several accusations that have been pushed under by Cedar County because uh, they have a, sh a sheriff deputy that works on the county payroll and that pulls security at Agape Boarding School at nighttime. Um, you, several deputies actually that do that. You can't tell me that a proper investigation can be done when somebody else is paying them. Um, that is not right. Uh, and there are a lot of other things. Um, I really think we need to, to dig in and use this these two bills as a base of like a starting point. Um, it's not 
as strict as I would like, but I'm willing to take anything that is better than what we have, which is nothing, and that's what you have. Um, and I'm not just talking to Missouri. I'm talking to New Mexico as well. So I, I've been all over the place because I think there's, there should be no price limit on a child's life. Uh, we, we talk about save our kids, you know, yeah, save them from slavery and uh, prostitution rings. But in the state of Missouri right now as we speak at Agape Boarding School, there's 165 students that woke up an hour ago that are forced to stand on the wall, eat cereal, while other kids are eating pancakes. Um, they're, they're forced to uh, go do physical workouts until they puke. They may even be getting restrained as we speak. And restraints are not like your uh, CPS department lines it out to be. The restraints at the Agape Boarding School result in kids getting picked up over the head and slammed into walls. I've seen kids put through walls. I've been put through a wall. Uh, kids getting slammed on tile, concrete, and asphalt. Um, so I'm here to ask for your support in this bill and to help save kids in our country. Um, and starting in Missouri, and maybe later on we can do something nationwide. But uh, thank you for hearing me, and thank you for allowing me to be here. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Oh, just wait, please stay. <laughs> thank you for, for um, traveling to Missouri to share your testimony. Um, are there any questions of this witness? Okay, seeing none, thank you for being here, sir. Safe flight. Would the next witness in support please come forward? We're still having some trouble with people hearing, so if you'll, when you come up to testify, please make sure that the green light is on and that you're talking into the microphone. I also want to remind everyone that because you're all adults who are talking about your experience as minors, that firsthand experience is perfectly appropriate to share, and I really appreciate you being here to share that with us. I would ask you not to share the details of minors in the state currently, so if you know of anyone currently here to protect their privacy and their right to tell their own story. Thank you, please proceed when you're ready. Morning, guys. Um, so my name is Alan Knoll. Uh, everybody can hear me okay? Okay. Um, I was 10 years old when I was sent away. I was not a troubled child. Um, I was a rambunctious child, but I was 10 years old. There was no drugs or alcohol involved. Barely knew the difference between right and wrong. I was transferred out of the state of Washington across several thousands of miles, and I ended up in uh, Loosedale, Mississippi for my first program which also exchanged students with programs here that operated here. They would just trade students and take them back and forth. Um, at that program, it was called Bethel Boys Academy, and I'll get into the Missouri ones in a minute, but it's really important for me to share this with you. I was 10 years old, um, a very little, uh, little guy. I'm sure some of you have children yourselves. And that program, I encourage you guys all to look it up, um, was one of the most abusive things I've ever went, witnessed. I had dogs, pit bulls, sick on us, pit bulls that were trained to attack us, Yondo Shmidi, and we're running. Imagine what that's like for your 10-year-old. I was held down in swimming ponds and uh, under, held underwater. I personally witnessed people have to be resuscitated. All means of which is meant to control and put the fear in children so that it doesn't happen to them. There is no reason to do this to children, period. That is just a quick brief outline of what happened at Bethel. I please encourage you guys to look at because that's what's coming to your state. It's what's already here. These stories that's going on right now here in this state, you won't hear about it for 15 years because these people are going to kill themselves. They're going to turn to drugs and alcohol. It's going to take them a long time to recover. This is happening here now. You're going to hear about it in 15 years. That happened when I'm 10. I'm 34 years old right now. And so then I was moved to this state. I was moved to Stockton, Missouri. Agape boarding school, I was 13 at that point. I had been away from my mom, my brothers, my family. I didn't have Christmases or anything else, and none of that is relevant as it pertains to the law. But I, it's important for you to understand the psychological impact of a child. You're away from your family and everything that you know, and you're going to supposedly a place that's going to care for you. You're already dealing with a tremendous amount of anxiety, depression, of being away, and you go to a home. I went to that same program that Colton was just referencing. I was that boy standing on the wall. I was that boy that was restrained for two months straight every single day. That was me because sometimes I didn't want to go to church. I didn't have a choice. If you're going to go to church or we're going to throw you on the ground until you want to go to church. I was also rebellious and I never went to church. And so the two years 
or, or two months being held down for not wanting to go to church, for not believing into these people that are abusing me. I don't want to hear what they want to say and preach to me. So these things went on. I'm not going to get into too much more on the abuse. I do want to talk about the law. Um, and that law is um, the fact that we're discussing it is mind boggling in 2021. And I understand the politics and all that, and I spoke to them. I do appreciate the sponsorship of this bill and the bipartisan sponsorship of this bill and proposal. Um, background checks is a, is a must. I think that the fact that we even have to have these discussions or resistance or do these things, these minor things, um, uh, and, and have to do things to please other side, this is not a debate. If I kick a dog, there's more outrage than what's going on in this state. So I'm all on board for this. Obviously, I can't go against it. I, I ask that this not be the end. Every one here, every senator uh, or congressman or representatives, um, this cannot be the end. This could be the start. I am adamantly opposed to regulating religious programs, um, and, and I really do believe strongly that they should have a separate state and church. But I also believe in the civil rights of these children. I believe in the right to, this is their one shot, and I cannot passionately say how big of an impact this has on your community, and you're gonna hear from a bunch of people. We're not your community. They're bringing in people over here and they're bringing problems, and some of these people do live here now, but this impact that has had on me, I'm a man, and just to sit up here and, and be on the verge of tears right now should mean something to you. Please act and act now. And one other thing, um, and then I will wrap up and let the next witness speak. And, and, and please do not shy away from questions. I will take questions um, and, and, and be professional. But I have spent, I do want to say that the abuse and the trauma that I went through had a tremendous impact on my life. I made a terrible poor decisions. I suffered depression, anxiety. Um, I still suffer those things. I've learned to deal with them. Um, but through all the things of not learning how to live properly and being forced and beaten and tortured in these programs, um, I didn't make the best choices. And I'm 34 years old now, and I'm fortunate to say that I'm, I've written a book about my experience. Um, I've founded and co-founded uh, a nonprofit to help parents make different choices and provide counseling resources that will give them other options. That is what has become, not because of the programs and not because of this state who failed me personally. This state failed me. Uh, Miss, state of Mississippi failed me, but we're talking about this state. This state failed me, but I'm, I'm still here today, and I'm, I'm being that voice. Let's not let somebody else come up here in 10 years and have to say, why did you fail me? I question to you guys, I know that you may not have been in office then, is why did the state of Missouri fail me? And why is the Missouri, state of Missouri failing these kids right now? And so thank you guys so much. I really appreciate the time. I do understand um, the, uh, the religious factor, but it's not about that at all. So I'd love to take any questions and please feel free um, to answer. I'm, I will not, so. Thank you for being here. Are there any questions for this witness? Um, Vice Chair Bailey. To inquire. Question. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for being here. And um, uh, how, how long were you here in Missouri at that facility? Like what ages? Yes. So I, uh, I uh, two and a half years. I was at Agape Boarding School for about 31 months. I was between 13 and 15 years old. Okay. And you were restrained every day just because you didn't want to go? Um, towards the end of my stay, it became apparent there was an incident these programs cost a lot of money. Um, my parents were paying $2,000 a month, and, and the staff member, the owners, had come to me and asked me to call my mother to pay them. And I said no. And that was the, the reason I didn't want to go to church anymore, was because I, it became apparent to me that it was about money. Yeah. Um, and so I didn't, and I never went to church again. Yeah. And I was restrained for it. Unfortunately, money is sometimes the root of all evil. And I, I do apologize what happened to you. And you being here today is, I think, part of your healing. And I, I appreciate that. And you have courage. Honestly, I mean, that you're doing this right now is, is huge. And I, um, I thank you for being here. And um, I'm sorry they did that in the name of Christ because that's not what Christ is about. And, um, but I, I wish you well. And that you're here doing all this is, is wonderful, all, all the uh, witnesses. So I wish you the best, and thank, thank you. you so much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Dogan, please proceed. Thank you. Um, thank you, sir, for coming forward and telling your story. Um, I can only imagine the horror and the you know, trauma that that's 
uh, inflicted on you. Um, I would like to know, you know, at what point did you feel comfortable telling your story? Did you try and tell people what was going on when you were a kid? Or did you, you know, were you just scared and you couldn't do that at that point? Yes, uh, thank you for uh, asking. That is a great question. And one thing that, that could be approached in this bill is, yes, yes, I did. Uh, of course, I'm 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15 in these programs. And um, one of the things is, is they, they pre-program your parents, the community, to not believe anybody. Troubled kids, liars, they just are manipulative. They, don't, they just want to go home. That's what they're going to tell you. That's what they tell your parents when they drop you off. These children will lie. They also monitor your calls. They will hang up your phone if you start talking about anything there. Then they will call your parents and say, he's been acting up, he's manipulating you, don't worry, your child's in good hands. This happened regularly to me. Um, also, I did manage to escape and, and get to a phone and call 911. And this was not in this state, this is in Mississippi. And my eye was completely swole shut. And I did call 911, I waited until the police car, I hid. And I ran down there, and my eye was not just black, but my eye was out, like not like the ball, but swollen outwards. And um, the sheriff went inside and talked to them because this is how the strongness of these small communities, these, they choose these very small rural areas. But um, the sheriff went in, the sheriff came out and said, I, next time you won't get smart. And that's, that's what happened. That's, and, and the irony is, is I'd love to get that 911 tape and those things that happened. Also, CPS came in twice and uh, I was recorded on tape and left both times. And were your, were your parents able to be helpful or? No, um, I was sent when I was 10 years old. So I, I think um, without attacking my parents, um, I will be truthful. Um, I just believe, uh, I, d I don't think I was wanted. Um, I think there was other priorities in my uh, parents' life and so my parents, I would, you know, I still thought they loved me at that time, and, and uh, I would call. I, I don't think it mattered. I, I just don't think I was uh, going to go home. And today I think my mother does, maybe, because of what's going on and the ac advocacy work that I do. But I don't know, and I don't think it matters. I think um, there are kids there right now that don't have the same parental situation that I do. I mean, when I was at Agape, there was eight-year-olds there, eight-year-olds. And so who's going to be their voice if their parents don't believe them? You know, I get it. And so it's really important that we do whatever we can. You know, I'm not on the law side. I'm on the advocacy side. I'm, I'm out there every day just trying to be that voice. And I can only do my community good, but we, we can do better. Are there any further questions for this witness? Um, Thank you for being here. I'm going to say this to you, and then I won't probably say it to everyone else who testifies because I think that there's a trend here, and we're going to see a lot of the same types of things. And I'm a mother of six. I have five sons, and I see my son sitting there. And this is a very emotional testimony, um, and they're all going to be very emotional. And I just want to thank you for sharing your story and apologize on behalf of the state. Thank you, sir. Would the next witness please come forward? Thank you, guys. I'll take my mask off because I don't have a very loud voice. Thank you. And do you mind moving your microphone down just a little bit so they can hear? Thank can you. Can you hear me now? Okay. My name is Emily Adams. I'm a Bethesda girl, Bethesda Home for Girls. I was in um, Hattiesburg, Mississippi. I'm also representing all my Bethesda sisters. Sorry. <laughs> than I thought. Um, I was sent there because my mama caught me smoking a cigarette. She made me eat the pack. I got nicotine poisoning. I ended up um, in, almost ended up in foster care and I embarrassed my mother and they had me kidnapped and sent to Bethesda. Um, it was under Bob and Betty Wills. It's down a long dirt road. We call it the road to hell. It was way out in the boonies. 
because you can't run, there's nowhere to go. And there was this big sign, it was red, white, and blue, said Bethesda Home for Girls. So that was kind of the, it should have said abandon hope, all ye who enter here. Um, I was there, we think, I think I was there about 17 months. It's kind of hard to pin it down. I brought some of my girls' statements, and there's one I wanted to make sure I read part of it. She gave me permission to use her name. So this is from Mardell Lister. And she was there in 1983 when, oh boy, <laughs> I'm going to cry. When she got there, they made her drink a big glass of Epsom salts, and she was pregnant. Then um, when she started cramping, they made her put on a Kotex with one of the old style belts. And then they made her start scrubbing the hall. And she miscarried. And she was scared. And she didn't know what to do. So she wrapped her baby in a newspaper and she threw it in the trash. And then she got back to scrubbing the floor. This is some of what they put us through. They did Lysol enemas, douches. My first day there, they t um, Elizabeth Stanford, I'm going to use names because if you don't want me to use your name, then you didn't do anything wrong, right? I was 15. I was a virgin, so this was very embarrassing. She took me into room. I was on my period. She made me strip naked. Um, then to prove that I didn't have anything in my vagina... I didn't even know you could stick anything up there. And I didn't do drugs, so. But she made me do jumping jacks. Blood clots came out of my vagina all over the place. That was when I first learned my body was not going to be mine. And um, then I got, then I learned that I was only going to be wearing dresses and tennis shoes. My first lunch there was chili cheese dogs with cloves and mayonnaise on top. That's when I learned if you puke, you eat it. So I did. Um, the first three months you're there, you were on watch. That means you have a helper who you are with 24-7. The other girls on watch, you can't look at them. You can't touch them. You can't talk to them because they don't exist. And I have poor facial recognition. So I got in trouble a lot because I couldn't remember. I didn't recognize who was on watch and who wasn't. I constantly got in trouble. Um, I wanted to, our education system was the PACES. Luckily for me, I do well in school. I only had um, like a couple of math classes to the left. Um, Robert O'Brien was our head of the school, even though he had gone through the PACE system. He didn't know it was butt from a hole in the ground. He was surprised because a lot of the girls were way behind in their education. Um, I actually did my junior and senior year there in two months because I was hoping it would get me out of there. <laughs> nope. So I was like, okay, I'm going to take chemistry and physics. I ain't got nothing else to do. I got a beating in front of the entire school for vanity. Girls need to get their MRS degree. We don't need chemistry and physics. When I got A's in both of them, I got another whooping. I'm going to graduate my BS in March with a <laughs> health care management so yeah. 
Um, we had to memorize and quote the Bible in order to eat. Um, if a girl was dyslexic, had never read the Bible, she didn't eat. Other girls were put in charge of making them quote it. Some of us would try to let them slip by. Some of the girls made them quote it. Girls could not eat for a long time. We had forced fasting. We weren't allowed to have thoughts. We couldn't do anything. And like Alan said, they read our letters. If you didn't say the right thing, they beat you. You said the wrong thing on the phone, click, they beat you. You couldn't, you went to town on a tour, they begged for money, even though your parents were paying. They would put you in the white top and the pleated skirts and sit you in church and tell everybody, see these dirty girls? Nobody wanted them. Their parents didn't want them. Please give us money so we can feed them. Look at these dirty girls. We're the only ones. Nobody wants them. We heard it over and over that we're worthless, we're trash. That's what I left there thinking. My life was a disaster. My abusers were closed down a year after I left. Bethesda Home for Girls was raided by the FBI finally and shut down. Guess where they came, y'all? They came here. They opened up Mountain Park in Patterson. Will Futrell was murdered at Mountain Park by two of the students because they wanted to get away. They tried to escape. They killed Will with pocket knives because they were so desperate to get away from what Bob Betty Wills and Sam and Debbie Gerhardt were doing to them. And then they got life without parole. So they went from the hell of Mountain Park to the life without parole. They lost, Will lost his life. And then those two guys lost their lives. They couldn't get help. So can you please, please, please help the kids now? No more survivors. No more. Please, thank you. If you have any questions, I don't care how embarrassing it's going to be. Ask away. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you very much. You're welcome. Can I see a, if you could raise your hand if you're here to testify in support of this bill? So, right, I'm going to set a timer because I have no idea how to, to interrupt your testimony. It's incredibly moving. And so to do that in a way that's respectful, I'm going to set a five-minute timer so we make sure everyone's able to be heard. And when it goes off, I'll ask if you could finish your thoughts. The next witness would like to come forward. You can proceed when you're ready. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm here today to tell you my story to show you how far back this goes. I'm going to show you my scars inside and out. I'm a Rebecca girl, Lester Roloff, 1976 to 1979. I was sent there court ordered. I was a ward of the state, removed by DCFS in the early 70s for abuse, which led me to foster homes, group homes, state homes, mental hospitals, to the runaway community, to juvenile detention, which led me to Rebecca by the age of 13. I wasn't a bad kid. I was an abused child. I thought I was finally safe. But I wasn't. When the doors locked, I didn't talk or see my family for the next three years. <laughs> These aren't regular homes. These aren't normal homes. This ain't even normal abuse, what we went through. The children that came in damaged like myself. We needed counselors and therapists, but there is none. I saw I tried to commit suicide, but I was thrown in a lockup instead. I don't know how long I was even there. Um, I'm not here today about what happened to me. My concerns are the children of today. 
When I joined Breaking Code Silence, I realized the dates and the pictures of some of these young children. And what happened to me in 1970 is happening to children in 2021. And that's a shame. But the best description I can give of IFB home, Independent Fundamental Baptist, the religious home, this is the best description I have used in the last 40 years of my story. I, I'm a sex offender. I went to church and got saved by Jesus. God put a burden on my heart to open a home and save children. Please let me reform your child. They don't do background checks. They believe in corporal punishment. The first abuse charge was Rebecca, 1973, which led to many court battles. Many court battles after different states, different homes, different stories. These are spinoff of Lester Roloff homes. They move in the middle of the night, state to state, chased out due to mental abuse, emotional, and physical. Most are the workers that came off of our farm back then in Roloff Enterprises in Corpus Christi, Texas. They, threw, they spread it through the states after the federal raid in 1979. Religion is a belief. You cannot force a belief on anyone. If you're raised Catholic, you're going to have them beliefs. Everyone, every religion has its own Bible. Every religion has its own belief. Which one's right? Which one's wrong? There is no right and wrong. Whatever you believe, whatever you're raised in. My mom was IFB. But you cannot force a child held behind fences and locked behind locks to believe in what you believe. But they try, and in the process, there was a horrific abuse done in God's name. I'm a survivor of it and a witness to others. I'm also a survivor of the biggest court case in church and state in ever, Lester Roloff versus Texas in 1973 to 1979, all the way to the Supreme Court, to the Christian alimony, till, till today. Many do not have any training with children, just that burden in their heart. There is no professional therapist, counselors, and teachers. And because of this, when I was released, I had no school credits. I had to get a GED, just like many others. Many IFB homes are through the state with horrific child abuse. How many children got to suffer at the hands of evil people? And God being all the others should be shut down now. There is no medical treatment. I watched a girl get stabbed three to five times in the back and sat in the office until her mom drove from Kansas to Texas to get her to get her to the hospital with stab wounds. We were given a chemical that stopped our monthlies. Stopped our monthlies. And we suffered many issues, female issues, and many couldn't bear children. I have no period the whole time I was there, three years. But don't get me wrong, babies were born and they were illegal adoption. And I do have that on their own words and testimony. Over 100 babies, no paperwork. But there is DNA now, and DNA has proved our stories. They do not believe in the law of the state, but the big black book, the King James Version Bible. We memorize chapters at a time just for a small privilege. We are beat black blue and bloody, told how worthless we are and not loved. There is no emotional support. We need oversight in these homes to protect our children of today. They need protection because they cannot speak out without punishment. I don't want any child to endure what I went through. Emotional, physical abuse. Now as a grown woman, I look back as the damage it caused me through my, life, my adult life. No children deserves an end before the start. I would like to take the last few minutes to express my experience of my home. I broke one of the top five rules. I got 20 licks with a board twice a week for three years. I'm so a sorry. A homemade board. I, know, I, I hate to interrupt you, but I want to make sure everyone has an opportunity to be heard. Do you mind okay, wrapping up? I'm almost up? done. I'm, okay, okay, thank you. A homemade board, two foot long with holes drilled in it. For the, to smooth the pain, the, the pain and the swelling and the bleeding, I would soak my bottom in the toilet water. I stood for hours, 10 hours or more. With, with one girl broke a rule, we all got punished. We are put in a lockup room, isolated with the intercom playing sermons 24 seven, no shower and little food. I experienced that punishment for three weeks or more for my suicide attempt. Many other girls experienced the punishments and some were far worse than I described. I just want to bring some light on the abuse and the torture that we through these homes, through the years, and it's a shame that there's decades of us here 
from 1970s all the way to 2000 with the same stories and it's still going on and nothing is being done. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Are there any questions for this witness? Thank you so much for sharing your story. The next witness in support. Thank you, please proceed when you're ready. Hi, can you, uh, everybody hear me? Okay, I'll make this as quick as possible. My name is Nicole Norton. I am 41 years old. I currently live in the state of Illinois. At one point in time, I lived in South Beach, Florida, and I was sent to Victory Christian Academy in October of 1996 until the fall of 1997. Um, I was taken there by my parents, we were immediately separated. I was taken one way. They were taken to see the tour of the facility and get the shiny, happy version of it. I was immediately slapped across the face by staff. Um, I got to keep nothing of personal property. I was given a King James Version Bible. That was pretty much all we owned. Some girls had pictures of their parents. Um, there's no jewelry or anything. It was a simple cross. We were forced to wear full-length skirts, dresses, blouses, pantyhose, slips, dress shoes, and that was a day-to-day -day thing. Um, if there, were, there was daily slaps, beatings, kicking, um, staff holding girls down, sitting on them for hours on end, and then there had the level of indoctrination and brainwashing was so much that they had the girls called helpers. And if the staff wanted a break or was tired of sitting on a girl, you know, they took their place. So it was peer on peer abuse. And I was sat on, I was tackled and sat on for hours. And if staff walked by and you weren't using pressure points on who you were pinning to the floor, they would yell at you, and you would have to dig your thumb into their neck or their back. Um, we were starved. If you came in and you were a heavy girl like me, I weighed 180 pounds roughly when I got there. After seven months, I left there weighing 110. Um, I was put on quarter rations, and there were other girls there who were extremely skinny, and they were put on double food trays, and if they threw up, it was saved for them and it was covered with plastic and served to them for the next few days in a row until they ate their own vomit. Um, the worst experience for me, um, I did not go at the flow of the program. I did not believe in their religion. I didn't think I needed to be there because I was an honor student and taking college prep classes in high school. When I got to this place, they literally had me doing schoolwork where I was doing the ABCs and adding one plus one. I received no school credits for it. I had to go to summer school and night school to catch up with my class and graduate on the time and year I was supposed to. Um, but because I did not go with the flow of the program and I was boisterous about it, um, the uh, helpers and staff decided that I needed to be silenced. What that means is Miss Betty, one of the staff members came and she put duct tape right here over my mouth. She had all the other girls in the big circle in the community room. It was announced that I was to be silenced for seven days. The duct tape only came off for meals and showers. And I could not speak, I could not write, I could not communicate in any way. And it brought me to my lowest point and I wanted to commit suicide. I was looking for anything and everything that I could hang myself with but the thing is, is the brainwashed girls are everywhere throughout the facility. And I mean, they see something like you sneeze and they don't like the way you sneeze, you got in trouble. If you bit your nails, you, that could be a beating. You know, I went off on a staff member and I ended up in what was called the get right room, which is really a janitor's closet with a deadbolt lock on it. And I was in there for a few days, urinating and defecating in the corner. Um, it was used frequently, it was used often. Um, it's just, I, there's, I could talk for days and hours and ends on the abuses, but we were beaten, we were starved, we were 
kept in isolation. Uh, some girls were duct taped to chairs. You know, I had my duct tape on my mouth for seven whole days. Um, if one girl made a mistake or even a pair of scissors went missing one day, so they had us all standing up with our heads against the wall with our hands behind our backs, and we stayed in that position until somebody gave up who took the scissors. So it was like girls pointing and fingers at other girls and saying, hey, I know it was you, I know it was you, and, and it's just, it was just insane craziness. There's no accreditation, no licensing. These people weren't doctors, they weren't therapists. They were just Baptists, Southern Baptists, and wanted to help children. They did everything to me but rape me. I was being inappropriately touched by Brother Brown, and I had grabbed his arm, and I says, you touch me, you're gonna have to kill me. And there were girls there as young as 10 years old, and any one girl that was smaller, shy, or quiet, and got sent to some of somebody's office or out the front door to Michael Palmer's house, who is now dead, thankfully, um, you knew what was gonna happen. You knew what was going on. We would micro-write notes and hide them in the bathroom. I got a note from a young girl, and she says, they're touching me. I wrote back, what? And she says, there's two of them raping me, Michael Palmer and Brother Brown. And my immediate thought was to run away. How do, I, how do we get out? You can't get out. The doors are locked. The, the windows are screwed shut. The alarm is set at night. They have laser grid alarms on the floor. So if you get out of your bunk bed to touch the floor to go to the bathroom, which was a privilege you had to earn, just to go to the bathroom, you had to beg for it. I mean, I'm I so have- I'm sorry to interrupt you. The timer's gone off. And like I said, I wanna make sure everybody has an opportunity to testify. If you could okay. close your remarks. Um, anyway, I said, you know, Victory Christian Academy, 1996, 97, please vote yes on this because you have no idea at all what goes on in these places. We could all talk for days, hours, weeks, months, and you still wouldn't not understand. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions for this witness? Thank you for being here. Would the next witness please come forward? Guys, <clears throat> my name is David Bowsher. I'm going to be brief, but I just want to just make a quick point to you guys. I'm sorry, just oh, one moment. Sorry. Make sure you're talking. And then do you yes. make sure you have a witness form, too, that you'll fill out. I have, and I okay, have. Okay, thank you. I think it was. Okay, I appreciate time. it. Okay, Go yeah. ahead. Um, like I said, my name is David Bowsher. I went to Bethel Boys Academy when I was 16 years old to 17. Um, and when I was there, I became what's called a leader or a senior cadet. And my responsibility was to discipline and I'm personally responsible for abuse to kids on behalf of the owners. And there's things that I regret and I'm very sorry for. Um, and again, they bred me that way. I did what they asked. Um, and today, it took me a long time to get through it. My life, I, after I left, I got worse into drugs, ended up going to jail, got into a lot of trouble. And it took me a while, but today I'm married. I have three kids. I love the Lord, I'm a Christian, and I'm an advocate as well. And we have talked to, all of us back here, we have talked to hundreds and hundreds of survivors. And I talked to so many people today that tell me, I want nothing to do with the Lord. I want nothing to do with Jesus. Anybody who treats me that way, in the name of God, I want nothing to do with their religion. And Jesus is love. And what you're hearing today, does that sound like love? Does that sound like an image that we want to give to kids, that this is what people do or what God is? I mean, it just has to stop. There's more damage being done than we know. You know, it's just, it's just overwhelming to me, the stories that we've heard. It's just insane. So stop it here, stop it nationally. It's a huge problem, huge, more than you guys realize and more than you know, and that's it. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions of this witness? Seeing none, thank you for being here. Would the next witness please come forward?
Good morning. My name is Shelva Thomas Jackson, and I'm from Crosby, Texas. Uh, January 2017 was the date that uh, the month and the year that I sent my son, Loyal, to Masters Ranch. I, I'm just driving in from Texas. Had the letter that I wanted to read to you, and I'll send it to you later, of the letter that he wrote to me, and I thought he was acting out. Being that I retired from the Texas Department of Criminal Justice as a licensed chemical dependency counselor, I felt like I was doing the right thing. I couldn't help my son. One of the things that I asked about, being that I worked for the penitentiary system, was that what about sexual acting out? What I was told by Teresa Bosley was, how big is your son? I was asked that. How big is your son? I said, he's a football player. And she's like, okay, would you send a picture to, to me so I could see him? I sent her a picture, and she, sends, she calls me back and she says, um, your son doesn't have to worry about being molested. You know, there is sexual acting out. He's a pretty big boy. Sexual activities wouldn't happen unless he wanted. So I thought about it and I'm like, my son did something and I don't think that he warranted it me to send him there. It wasn't that bad when I think about it right now, opposed to the things that he told me, that they beat boys, uh, that a kid was molested in June 2017, and then uh, the next day he says, Mom, Pastor Bosley says that he's taking care of everything. The older kid has been sent away, and the younger kid has been sent to another house, and they separated the boys from BB to KK on the way driving here and seeing those highways that said BBKKBB, it made me sick. I trusted in David Bosley and Teresa Bosley and their program. I quit my job, so everything that I had, put everything in storage. They moved me from Texas to Couch, Missouri. Twice they moved me. Shelva, if anything doesn't work out, we'll make sure you get back. But my son was supposed to come back with me to stay on Master's Ranch. And he says, no, Mom, you go. He said, I want you to see what I've been through. So I was like, if you don't get your life right, you're going to go to prison. You're going to do this. You're gonna... He said, if I could withstand Master's Ranch, I could withstand anything. I was there seven days, and I look at the fact that God created this earth in seven days. In seven days, I was there at Master's Ranch. I saw a child be bullied, get his arm dislocated, them telling him, suck it up, buttercup, and then get him in an ambulance. You got to call David Bosley first before you call an ambulance to this 11-year-old child that I told you was being uh, bullied by this other kid. Two days prior to that, uh, they were playing with slingshots. I come from the penitentiary setting, so everything is a weapon. This is a weapon if you want it to be. Kids had slingshots, was in the barn shooting a nail. The nail ricocheted and hit the child in the eye. For two days, that child cried on the couch, begging for somebody to help him. Kids were taunting him. Oh punk, fag, this, you're just acting like a baby and your mom just calls over here and starts all this trouble. The child laid there for two days. When they finally took the child to the emergency room, he had to have come back the next day for emergency surgery because he had a torn cornea. I got pictures. When they started seeing that I was taking pictures and making notes and making videos, I'm going to record everything you're doing because what you're doing is inhumane to kids, kids putting people down in restraints, having their knees down in their back. I got pictures of that. Kids being bitten by flies. Not only that, I paid $42,000 for my son to go here. My son and other kids that I witnessed defecate in the barn because they are not allowed to go up the house to use the bathroom during the day because there's not enough staff to watch them and one of them might decide to kill themselves, or one of them might decide to kill staff. That's the rule. We go out fishing, 
come back fishing with buckets of, um, one second, one, buckets of uh, fish. And I'm like, how are we going to clean this? They run in the house. My, my, the, my little boy, the one that got the, the arm dislocated, he runs in the house and come back with about 10 knives. Where do they do that? But I paid $42,000 to send my son to a trained detention center when I should have left him at home and got it for free. You, I'm asking you, I have driven all night long. My son, I said, would you want to go? He says, Mom, do what you want to do. He says, I'm sick of this. That's all we talk about. Tell me, lawyer, what they do. Tell me what happened. But I saw it for myself. No kids. You, they need to be, man, I've written everybody. I've written CPS. I've written everybody. And I, I said, you know what? I'm going to start my own website. And it's www.deersdream.com. And it's about Masters Ranch and every other ranch or that have kids there that make people think that you can't help your child. There are no behavioral modifications. There are no type of didactics for these kids. What are you teaching them? You use my son as a slave and every other kid there for your benefit. Your car, your house, your peacock, your longhorns, everything is yours. Where are the horses that's so fabricated at this place? You told me I was paying $42,000 for a working ranch. My son has lost scholarships. He's 19 years old. He went back to Texas with three credits. And every day I fight for him not to give up because I refuse for him to be a statistic and let David Fosley and Masters Ranch or any of these places get away with hurting kids because I have been hurt. I know what it's like to be sexually abused and be hurt by people you trust. Hurt people hurt people. And if you don't stop it, if nothing changes, nothing's going to ever change and you're going to have recidivism everywhere. That's all I got to say. Do something, please. Thank you for being here. Can I ask Sorry. you? No, no, please, please. Can you sit down? I have a question for you, if, if you're able to. You're the first parent who's been able to come and testify. And when I see my son hurt every day. I know. Day. I All just, of his friends got scholarships for football this year, and he's 19. He'll be 19. And David promised him for weeks, I'm going to come see you play. My son don't have a father waiting for David on that sideline for him to see David so David can see him score that touchdown for p Dolls. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, th I, I appreciate you being here. I, you have a corrections background and you made a decision to send him to a school here in the state of Missouri rather than in Texas. And I just was gonna ask you, what, what kind of research was available? Did you have any ability to find any of this information? It was cost. Okay. This is the cheapest that I could afford. Yeah. $42,000 was what I could afford. Texas, uh, that he had to be awarded of the state mm -hmm. for Texas to be able to take him into a program. Missouri, it's any willy nilly. I dro just drop him off. Yeah. I can't believe I did that. I, I, I appreciate so much your willingness to be here and to testify and. I, I'm not asking that to cast in any way any judgment on that. I think that people get to a point where they don't know what to do and they think they're reaching out to those who can help them. And so I want to thank you for your willingness to be here to testify and thank for you. advocacy on your behalf of your son. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank Are you. there any other questions for this witness, Representative? Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chairman, to, to inquire. Um, thank you for your courage in, in coming here and telling your son's story and telling your story. Um, it, it is very unique that you are a parent who has that experience. The other stories we've heard have been from the children themselves. Um, so I just, <clears throat> it, it just shocks me that th this place is still open, and Masters making, Ranch. They got a new school. They've been shut down in Washington. They can't do it in Washington anymore, but they have a new girls' school now. And it needs to be shut down. David has a fetish with guns. It, it, it's... And they're located in Couch, Missouri. What do you Couch. know? What part of the state that that's in? Uh, it's Thayer. There's Thayer, Couch, and Myrtle. They have two two ranches. I don't know where the girls' ranch is, but uh, one of them is in Couch, and that's the KK Ranch, and the BB Ranch is in Myrtle. 
Okay. To the jury. And um, you, you mentioned that your son has been basically denied all kinds of different opportunities because of the the experience he's, he's had to go through there. Yes, sir. And, um, and see, when he was two years old, that the, how we had the money for him to go, he lost three fingers off of his hand. He's an extraordinary kid with a great, with promise and ability. And we gave it to David. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> and just la last question. Um, is there any kind of a network of other parents, I do um, have. of survivors? I just met with a, a child that, uh, and his mother. Um, I met with them for lunch yesterday. The child was going to come. He's 15 years old. She actually went there in November and stole him back. And he's in tech. He's in Houston now. And I met with him. He wanted to come, but he was afraid that David Bosley might be here and that David would probably try to steal him back. He's 15. I have other parents that have gone through the same thing. They hate God. My son won't go to church. I have I, My son keeps in contact with a few of the boys. Um, this is the trickery. David has even tried calling my son to tell my son that the reason why he didn't help me get back on my feet when I went home was because I vandalized the, the house. And my son was like, my mom did not do that. It's, I compare it to, and it's in my web, on my website, David Koresh Waco, The Branch Davidian. Can you, what is your website again? www.dearsdream.com, D-E-A-R-S, dream, D-R-E-A-M. And my dream is to make sure that every child is treated dearly. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are there any other questions for this witness? Seeing none, would the next witness in support please come forward to testify? Please proceed when you're ready. Hi, um, my name is Amanda House, well, Amanda O'Brien. Um, I was not a student within one of these boarding schools, um, but my parents, Boyd and Stephanie Householder, started working within the troubled teen industry in 1994. So I was roughly three years old when they started working for facilities like this. Um, in 2001, we moved to Agape boarding school where my dad became head of staff. Um, as a staff child there, I did not see a lot, but what I did see happen was boys being thrown to the ground, being restrained. Um, boys having to stand on the wall for hours, or sorry, not hours, but for months on end. There was one little boy while I was there, he was 12. He's not a little boy anymore, but he was 12. And he looked at me and my father told him, if you look at my daughter again, I will cut off your, and he was talking, yeah. Um, so in 2006, my parents opened up a all girls boarding school called Circle of Hope Girls Ranch in Humansville, Missouri. I was 15. Um, they didn't have any staff, so as a 15-year-old, um, I used myself as a staff. Um, and other um, students within the boarding school. Um, so being a staff, I was forced as a teenager to restrain my other, my, my friends that were my age that were in these boarding schools. Um, for stupid things, like we had a set of siblings that um, that were there and they were not allowed to look at each other. And so if they looked at each other, we had to throw them on the ground and go get my father. So my father would come and help facilitate the restraints. These restraints would last for hours. Um, I remember the sisters particularly because they were restrained side by side for literally looking at each other. One sister has a mental disability and um, she couldn't control her emotions. So this girl in particular, while I was there, was being restrained all the time. She was always in a black shirt because they had a level, like a shirt system, and the black shirt was the lowest shirt. She was always in the shirt because of her disability and her not being able to control herself at like her age. This woman did not leave Circle of Hope until 2020, last year. She was there for 13 years and she was 30. She was a 30-year-old woman being restrained by my own parents. 
She would not have left if we did not speak up. At one point, they had a five-year-old girl, too. Um, so they took in kids from the age five, obviously, until they were adults. There were women that, were, that are my age that were forced to stay there after 21. Um, my parents would not let them leave. I was kicked out at the age of 17 because that five-year-old girl was afraid her mom was going to go to hell for wearing pants. And I told her, if her mom was gonna go to hell for wearing pants, then my dad's mom, my sister, and my aunt are in hell today. And my parents didn't like that because that went against their program. Um, so I was kicked out. But if I was not kicked out, I would not have been able to leave on my own. These women were forced to stay because they were afraid. They were told if you left, the people in the town would either shoot you for being on their property because of the um, law in Missouri, shoot um, first, ask questions later, or they were told that animals would get them, or they were told that they would just be prostitutes. I was a child of staff members that worked in these programs. I myself, when I got out at age 18, I went to drugs. I turned to drugs myself. I sold drugs to get to where I was at now. I had to do what I had to do to survive. And I was a child of people running these facilities. I was not sent to one of these facilities. I was a child of parents that were supposed to help kids, but instead they were abusing them. And the only reason why I bring up what I did after is because of the fact that they didn't help their own daughter. How are they gonna be able to even help other people's kids? Thank you. Are there any questions for this witness? Thank you for being here. The next witness in support, please come forward. Please proceed when ready. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank the people who talked before me for their bravery um, today. My name is Jessica Seitz, and I'm the director. I'm so of sorry, Jessica. We can't hear you. Oh. If, can you just speak up? Yeah. Thanks. Usually not my problem. Um, <laughs> uh, it's green. Is that better? All right. I got this. So uh, my name is Jessica Seitz, and I'm the director of public policy with Missouri Kids First. Um, Missouri Kids First is a state network of child advocacy centers, and there are 15 regional throughout the state who assist in the investigation and prosecution of child abuse. And so these, um, these schools first came on my radar um, when Circle of Hope was invaded in um, August. Um, over the years, some of my CACs have seen kids who have lived at these schools, um, but not very many and not enough and that's because of lack of oversight. Um, I've been working with Representatives Veet and Engel on this bill so long that I almost lost sight of what we were here, and so the, the stories this morning were really powerful. So this bill is critical for keeping kids in Missouri safe, and it is long, long overdue, as I think you can see from the witnesses who spoke today and their ages. Um, so lack of oversight of unlicensed residential facilities in Missouri has been an issue here and has plagued child advocates for decades. Um, under our statutes, it's been on the books for 40 years. Missouri has a full religious exemption from any oversight of these facilities. Um, we are, according to National Conference of State Legislatures, only six states have an exemption like this. And Missouri is just one of two that require no additional regulations other than just claiming the exemption. So over the almost 40 years since this has been in place, horrific cases have come to the surface. When I started looking into these after I found out about the Circle of Hope, um, I actually found a series in the Post-Dispatch from 2002. And at that time, we were called one of the few states with this exemption. At that time, Missouri was called a haven for these schools. This was almost 20 years ago, and the school they were talking about was Mountain Park, and it was the one of the schools that was referenced earlier today. So here we are, 20 years later, that's the last time, 20 years ago, was when there was a bill put before or even discussed. Hasn't been touched, it hasn't been touched in the Capitol, 
in over 20 years, and more abuse, more facilities. Other states have strengthened their laws, and now Missouri essentially stands alone. Um, and we know that at least seven schools have moved here um, after being investigated or shut down for abuse and neglect in other states, um, started back up here in Missouri. So um, Representative Steve Ingel went through the bill, and I'm happy to go through the details of the bill um, at another time, because I know we're short on time. But this legislation would help us know where these facilities are, be able to check on kids, and if necessary, shut them down. Um, we've got to protect children, ensure our state is not a hospitable place for predators. It's time. I don't want to see another 20 years go by. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Seitz, for being here to testify. I have a few questions for you. Yeah. So one of the questions that I have is we worked closely last year on looking at Chapter 210 and 211, and I don't see anything in those statutes that when a hotline call is made that provides an exemption for the investigation of an allegation of abuse. What's the breakdown when one of these children has been able to essentially been able to to get the word out about what's happened to them? And then what's happened? Where's that failure been over the last 40 years or 50 years? Um, you know, through many, this is not a current administration, this is many administrations and processes. So where's that breakdown happening that when a hotline call has been put in and there is a response? So, um, so I'd say that the, the biggest has been not knowing that they, these places exist. They're in very remote areas and there are, they're like, our response system doesn't kick in. There is not a, there is not a hotline call. Um, but when a made. hotline call has been made? What has happened? Because I know we have records of hotline calls happening at these facilities. So, sir. Um, so, some like I would say that there's folks. I would, I would ask Department of Social Services to make sure that I'm not I'm not speaking in, incorrectly. I can um, I'll, I can ask yeah, the follow up. Yeah, That's so, fine. That's fair. I can say that um, at the schools there have there has been abuse that has been substantiated um, at this and there's but. There's no way for parents who send their kids at this time to find out that these places have substantiated abuse, and so they they, and they stay open, and there's not really a um, there's not a an impetus for being able to shut them down. But the but the abuse is happening at the hands of an individual, and why has that individual not been charged? Not had a follow up? Um, I see nothing in the code that exempts any person from hurting a no. child. And so why is this? So there's nothing, our, the, the, um, abuse is abuse is abuse. And so yes, there's nothing in our code that protects abusers. And this, what you've heard is abuse under our current law. Um, I would say that those individuals that have not been brought to justice um, have, there has, been a, there has been a breakdown in the investigation and prosecution of these cases. From, um, DA, I, from the department, from the local prosecutors, I think it All depends down. on the school. I would say, depending on the school, it would be different in, in parts of the multidisciplinary team um, throughout. So it's kind Can of hard to Can we pivot point. and talk a little bit then yeah. about licensed daycares and unlicensed daycares? Because yeah. I think there's a corollary mm. argument to be made that we have licensed facilities and we have unlicensed facilities. Mm -hmm. And our unlicensed facilities still have to have background checks. They still have to have registries um, to let the state know that they're operating. There's still certain parameters that protect them. And that's actually where we got a lot of this language. So the parts around um, minimum safety, health, and background checks, that language, if you check out our, um, the statutes around child care facilities, and I just reviewed them last night to ensure, it's almost mirrored language for child care facilities. And these are facilities that keep kids 24 hours a day for several, you know, for months, years. And so um, if any, it's Missouri Kids First position, this is the bare minimum that we can do. Okay, thank you so much for your testimony. Are there any questions for this witness? Representative Daly, please proceed. So a follow-up question um, from the chairman. So these hotline calls to uh, Division of uh, Children and Families, so is there, are there a record of those? I mean, can we look at those? And because I, I too, we're, as a state, we've broken down somewhere because abuse is abuse regardless right. of any exemption. So, and you may not know this, yeah. but... That is a that's a critical piece. That um, wow, we, we missed the, we missed the ball on that one. Um, that I'm sure for years I would imagine children or wh whoever, even staff may have hotlined some of this stuff. So um, we need to fix that piece. So I would love to. I don't know if I could get that information, but see some hotline calls 
when, dates, why weren't they followed up on, who investigated it, and why, who, who was the block? Was it the local prosecutor? We obviously don't have jurisdiction, but this is hopefully going to change that piece. But if, if yeah. we can talk about that, I would love to look further into that because, like I said, while well, we've dropped the ball. Certainly. Um, and several, I would say, um, Kelly Schultz from Office of Child Advocate and Department of Social Services is going to be here for informational, so they'll be able to answer your questions. And if they don't, we can talk about it, Alpha, because I agree. Thank you. I do think that um, it's been very clear, especially in the most recent cases, but in definitely in the past, I'm just more familiar with the more recent, that there had been a multidisciplinary team breakdown in the investigation and prosecution of these cases. Thank you. Are there any other questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you for being here today. Are there any other testimony in support of? Okay. You often testify for informational purposes, so that was the pause. Oh, I'm towing the line today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Please introduce yourself. So I'm Kelly Schultz. I'm the director of the Office of Child Advocate. We are the third party reviewer to Children's Division. Um, I'm going to be very quick in my testimony, and then I'm happy to answer questions. So a lot of people have talked about what this legislation is. I'm going to flip it. I'm going to talk about what this legislation is not. This is not licensure. We are still exempting religious facilities we do have religious facilities in the state of Missouri who are licensed, but we are still leaving the ability for religious facilities to be unlicensed. So this isn't licensure. This is not registration. This is not an ongoing relationship with these facilities in a registration. This is notification. The bare minimum of what it's gonna take to protect children. Let us know where you are, background check your employees, if there is an allegation of abuse or neglect, we need to see the children. In licensed facilities in Missouri, part of their licensure is that they allow access to children. We're just asking for the same thing for unlicensed. And finally, when there is evidence of abuse and neglect, we do have the ability to shut you down. Again, for licensed facilities, when abuse and neglect happens in a licensed facility, there is a variety of actions that the state of Missouri can take, including shutting somebody down. So finally, I do really want to hit on this. This is not church versus state or state versus the church. It is very specific in this legislation that treatment, curriculum, is something that the state is not going to mess with. And I do have to be very careful not to take personal offense when we start talking about church versus state. I am a member of the church, and I do work for the state. Nothing changes for me Sunday morning to Monday morning. Just like when you guys took the oath of office and became part of the state, nothing changes with your faith. This is state versus people hurting kids and giving us the bare minimum of what we need to do to protect children in the state of Missouri. I read cases all day long. I talk about child abuse, neglect, and fatalities all day long. I'm usually not the butterfly when I come in and testify. I'm not warm and fuzzy in this committee. It turns my stomach to see what I read. And I think the only thing that turns my stomach even more is somebody doing this in the name of God. Because not only do we have trauma and abuse and neglect, but that threatens to separate a child from God for eternity, and that's probably the only thing that makes me more ill. So I, I'm going to be really short in my testimony, but I, I am happy to answer a variety of questions, so thank you. Thank you for being here. I have a number of questions for you. Thank you. As part of your capacity in the Office of the Child Advocate, do you review every death that happens in the state of Missouri for a child in custody or care? So when it comes to fatalities, the Office of Child Advocate reviews them in two separate ways. One, we review a specific fatality uh, when a caller to our office is, is concerned about a, a death of a child that they believe the state could have prevented. The second way is we participate in the Child Fatality Review Program for the state, and that is a more broad, systematic approach. And when you have... Um you also review serious injuries that happens to children that comes through your office. Can you talk a little bit about that? So 
there's a couple of different ways that we re review critical incidents. Um, the first way is, again, if a caller to our office calls and asks us to review a case. Um, sometimes that is, most of the time in that setting, it's child specific. So re review the cases involving child A. They also can call and ask for a more systemic approach where they may have several cases that they want us to look at so we can see if there's a pattern of concern. And finally, the state of Missouri is implementing a new critical incident review where it involves a broader audience of reviewing from the multidisciplinary team and an Office of Child Advocate is also part of that. In your review of these cases, is the testimony that you've heard today consistent with ongoing investigations that you've reviewed in the last five to a year? Yes. Uh, without breaching confidentiality and talking about any recent cases, I could have written some of this testimony that we heard today word for word current day. One of the things I find very troubling is that when I read the statute, I don't see an exemption for um, cases that we do learn about. I understand a lot of the testimony has been that people don't, we just don't know. Can you speak to the breakdown of what's been happening when we do learn? Yes, and there are several breakdowns and there's a, <laughs> A variety of cases and a variety of breakdowns. And so, again, without breaching confidentiality, we'll kind of point to what some of the potential breakdowns are. Um, first and foremost, you heard the testimony today. Um, nobody believed me. My parents didn't believe me. Law enforcement didn't believe me. Um, and it takes a long time for survivors to be able to come forward, too. And so I think one of the most powerful things I heard today was 15 years from now, we don't want to hear these same stories. We don't want to wait till somebody is at the point where they can testify. So that's breakdown number one. There is this lag of time when disclosure comes forward. Um, two, and we, it is very easy when we have vulnerable youth that have been labeled as troubled, behavioral, bad, master manipulators, to not believe them. And so even when a disclosure is crystal clear, there's some sort of feeling that these kids are bad and they're doing something to get back at somebody who's holding them accountable. You can potentially have a breakdown in MDTs. You can have children's division, law. Multidisciplinary. I'm sorry, multidisciplinary. I talk in code sometimes, thank you. Multidisciplinary teams. And the multidisciplinary team and in investigations would be children's division, law enforcement, the prosecutors, the CACs who do the, the forensic interviews, um, the juvenile office in Missouri who would be removing children. Um, and you can have breakdowns in MDTs where one player is moving forward and the other players, whether it is lack of communication, whether it is lack of role clarity, um, you can have a breakdown among those professionals. We see that. The, the breakdown of professionals. Everybody has a role, and everybody has a certain amount of discretion that plays into that role. Um, and if one person in one role is interfering with another person's role due to communication, distrust, lack of clarity, um, it, it breaks down and cases break down. So in these cases, we did a, a review um, and I did release a, a finding in the state of Missouri um, over a, a group of cases we reviewed. And, and I will say, in the ones that I looked at, I felt that children's division, little practice concerns, obviously if I'm reviewing something, I'm gonna find something that could have been done better. But overall, I really appreciated the role that children's division played. We also had STAT involved, the state technical assistance team out of DSS, and, and that's law enforcement. Um, we had local law enforcement. And in the cases that I saw, I saw some phenomenal work by STAT. And so I specifically cited those two players as, as being best practices. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any other questions for this witness? Oh, I'm sorry, Representative Shields, please, please proceed. Thank you. I, I just have a concern um, that, I mean, currently if we did background checks on these individuals, would anything show up because they've been able to do this without any 
<laughs> knowledge so, to law enforcement. I mean, that's... Mm -hmm. So the background check that's currently in the legislation is, is twofold. So it's a criminal background check, but it is also a check of the Family Care Safety Registry. Um, one of the places that was specifically stated today and has been reported in the press by the Kansas City Star, the individual had four preponderance of evidence findings, which would have placed them on the Family Care Safety Registry. So that would have been caught. Are there any other questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you for being here. Thank you. The next witness in support, please come forward. Hello, my name is Emily Van Shankoff, and I'm the director of the Missouri Children's Trust Fund. I just want to say that this is probably one of the most painful hearings I've ever sat through. Um, the stories that I've heard today have just broken my heart and have left me feeling um, embarrassed and ashamed of our state that we did not correct these problems much earlier. It also makes me feel embarrassment and shame that I did not know that these issues were going on as a child advocate and as someone who has done my job as long as I have, I feel like I should have known that this was occurring and that I should have asked you all to fix these problems many years ago. Um, so I have a great deal of sadness in my heart right now because, um, because this is egregious that this has gone on this long and I um, echo just the sympathies of everyone that for the folks in this audience uh, for what they went through and for the failure of our state. Um, so I would just say I'm in strong support of House Bill 557 and 560 and my board of directors shares my intense concerns about what has been revealed in the Kansas City Star articles and what um, has been shared today. Um, in my work, what I really know and what I have seen over and over again is that there are bad actors and predators and out there and there, is, there are evil people in this world and they want access to our children. And it's our job as advocates and as lawmakers to put up really strong barriers between bad actors and evildoers in our children. We wanna make it as hard as possible for them to get to our children because we do know that the harder you make it for people to get to kids, the less likely abuse is to occur. And what we've done with the laws that we have right now is we've taken, we have basically have a wire cutter. We've taken out a wire cutter and we've cut a giant chink in the fence that protects our kids and we let evildoers and wrongdoers come through this fence and hurt our kids. It is an invitation to predators, and I think we have seen that. This is a deeply vulnerable population, just because they are not five-year-olds, although apparently there are places where there are five-year-olds. These are vulnerable, vulnerable children. For far too long, we have silenced and discounted and ignored the voices of survivors and the voices of children. And it is my deep hope that we have the courage to hear the people that came before us, that came before me today, and to make this change that absolutely, I believe we are now compelled to make. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions for this witness? I, I'm sorry, I have something I just wanna ask. We've worked together for the last three years, and I respect you tremendously in the work that the, the Children's Trust Fund does. Um, when this issue started coming up, I did some some research as well, and the stories, um, they're cyclical, right? They hit the press every 20 years. And do you think that this fix is will be able to, um, to address that? Because I have to tell you, when I read chapters 210 and 211 of our code, I believe that it clearly states that no child should be should, should be in this situation, and I I don't think that the the changes that are being proposed are inappropriate, but I also believe our current code would have protected these children had it been followed appropriately, because a child is abused by a person, and we had credible accusations against individuals, and we didn't act, and so my question I guess is to say, let's say we pass this and the governor signs it, what prevents failures in this system? I think no system is, perf is perfect. I do think that's true. Um, I think that iterative growth and um, changing our policies and laws, I think this bill would make a tremendous difference because we would have these places identified. I'm not sure, I agree with you, that it would, wouldn't be enough. I think that we should perhaps look at that question closely. Yeah, I, and I don't know that I'm saying it wouldn't be enough, but what I'm saying is that we have statutory changes all of the time and I, I just am deeply upset that 
not only are these unknown cases, but the known cases weren't acted upon, right? And so when you have failure after failure about actually reported cases, and you who've dedicated your life to doing this work has missed it, and I who care deeply about these issues has missed it, I mean, do you I, know enough about what's happening in other states who have enacted similar legislation, and has that strengthened those states' responses? I mean, I probably. And I'm sorry, these are rather pointed no, questions, no, but no, and I love them. Um, I think that I, I think that they, that the other states that have done this, we have, we have become a beacon for these homes because of that. And so, just by putting up these barriers and putting these basic regulations in place, we will be less attractive for places to come here. So, I think that in of itself is a big change. I do think that other states that have done this have protected. They've, they've healed that hole in the fence. Um, I think that we can't get away from the larger question that I have grappled with my entire career is that what happens when law enforcement comes out to investigate this and decides that there's a lot of discretion. I did hear a police officer say this one time and it was controversial, but he said, what happened, who makes the police be the police? So what happens when law enforcement comes and investigates a child abuse crime and doesn't decide to take it forward to the prosecutor? Lots of cases get lost like this. I'm just putting it out there. There are lots of cases of child abuse that are never prosecuted, where the case goes from law enforcement to the prosecutor and the prosecutor decides not to take the case forward. I have seen egregious, egregious cases of child sexual abuse that prosecutors decide not to take to trial. Or to but that's a separate system it put in place, right? Because the Children's Division can make separate decisions based on the, the location of the child, whether there is, we talk about this all the time, right? Even if there is a finding and the prosecutor doesn't go forward, they make some kind of a plea deal or whatever is a, they, in their prosecutorial discretion move forward. Children's Division is a separate system that has an ability to remove the child. Um, so that is definitely true. Um, but I think that it's a larger question of accountability. And so Children's Division, in my opinion, I'm just going to speak candidly here, is, is we have a weak child welfare system. So we have a bifurcated child welfare system where our Department of Social Services cannot remove children. They have to make a petition to the juvenile office, and the juvenile office is the entity that will come in and decide whether or not a child is removed. That is a bifurcated system. Anytime you have a bifurcation, you have an opportunity and a crack that cases fall through. So if Children's Division, you know, they have to, the, our system requires seamless integration of our, of our multidisciplinary teams. And when that seamless, when that doesn't happen, which it doesn't happen a lot, kids fall through the cracks. And so um, I see it as an issue that is both a children's division issue, a juvenile office issue, a law enforcement issue, and a prosecutor issue. And they really can't be teased out for full accountability and for, for, for children to truly get what they need. Thank you for your, I appreciate it. Any other questions? Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Marcia Hazelhorst, and I'm the Executive Director of Missouri Juvenile Justice Association. We are here to support uh, both House Bill 557 and 560. We certainly um, believe it's necessary. Um, I, I don't want to be repetitive um, for all the same reasons that you've heard from previous testimony um, here this morning. Having worked as a juvenile officer for 17 years before coming to um, and Missouri Juvenile Justice Association, I did encounter um, some of these facilities that um, we, that had come to our attention through some various youth from my county that were placed in, in the facilities. And um, they do become very, very challenging situations. And there have been, in my experience, been lots of reports of very inappropriate discipline um, and punishment um, that definitely um, borders on child abuse and neglect, and in many cases was abuse to a child. Um, to um, uh, Madam Chair, your, your questions, I think that some of the um, challenges that come up is that parents send their children to these facilities. And so when you make contact with the parent and say there's been allegations, there's this report, and we need to co you to come get your child, or we need for you to you know, pick your child up and not return your child to the facility because we have concerns. Then it becomes a parent's decision to choose to do that or not. Um, and oftentimes they will come and get their children, but then we find out later that they've returned their child because the facility is still open. There's no regulation of the facility and you might be assured that a certain staff person's not there anymore only to find out that maybe they just were off for a few weeks and then they come back. So I think, Having some regulation of the facilities is definitely a first step. 
I'm not sure if it goes completely far enough um, because maybe you know having them to be licensed to adhere to the same licensing requirements that all of our other residential facilities have to comply with, I think would, would also be something to consider to really get to the heart of the actual practice in the facility and the regulation of them. Um, but I did want to point out that um, there is one paragraph in particular, 210.143, um, that uh, we have some concerns about the language um, and we would like an opportunity to work with the bill sponsors as well as the committee members to um, address um, some language concerns. In particular, um, we have juvenile officer performance standards that were adopted um, by uh, the Office of State Court Administrator and the Supreme Court in 2017 and standard 4.2 prevents the juvenile officer from basically um, involving themselves in the investigation process and the investigative piece because they are, they are the petitioner of the action if it were to go to juvenile court. And so um, it, it puts them in a direct conflict to get involved at that particular point of the investigation. And we think there is, because these should be um, co-investigations with law enforcement, they should, law enforcement would have the ability to seek an investigative subpoena if needed, um, because as I, as I read this, it's the, the, the concern is that the residential facility would not allow access to the child for the children's division and law enforcement to check on the child's well-being, which is certainly a problem and has to be dealt with. Um, but um, we do think that that would conflict with the juvenile officer performance standard, standards. In addition, there's a 2004 case, it's um, uh, Heartland versus Waddle, um, which is, is pretty significant case law um, that really changed the way the, the juvenile courts and the juvenile officers um, were able to seek an emergency removal of a child. And there's a fairly high standard in that, in that case law that basically says that the juvenile officer you know, cannot just immediately remove a child absent being able to show that the child is in serious, um, is in imminent danger of serious harm um, or sexual abuse. And you can't do that absent providing a party due process. So I think um, you know, we definitely um, want to address some of the language um, to make sure it's workable and that is something the juvenile officer is able to do and doesn't conflict with any existing case law or the performance standards. So thank so you. I just wanted to follow up on that in particular. Thank you for your testimony. Have you seen the substitute that um, is going to be offered on this bill? I have seen a substitute, yes. And do you believe that that substitute addresses your concerns? No, it still has that very specific language that the Children's Division, Juvenile Officer, Prosecuting Attorney may petition the circuit court. And it goes through um, that process of being able to, to potentially seek an ex parte order. So my question on that is, when I read that finding, because I pulled up the order from the judge, and I'll save the, the committee my reading of it, but my reading of it is different than yours. Your reading is that it's an extraordinary change. My reading was that it's consistent with the state law and that his finding was that it's as written. And that like religious freedom, parental rights are such a high standard that you have to have reasonable evidence of harm to a child before a, a child can be removed from the home or, right. or from a facility that the parents have selected. And I'm really struggling to see what's inconsistent with that finding and with this language. So I'll ask, can we set a time to have a, meet with, a meeting later with the bill's sponsors um, this afternoon to talk through that? Absolutely. Thank you. Are there any further questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you. Are there any other witnesses in support? Are there any other witnesses in opposition? Are there any witnesses for informational purposes only? Ms. Whaley, thank you for being here. We have just moments before we need to get up into the floor, and I think that the bill sponsors may want to um, to say something as well. So, I will be extremely brief. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to address a couple uh, address a couple. Of I'm sorry questions. for the record if you'll introduce sorry. yourself. Sorry, Caitlin Whaley, Department of Social Services. I just wanted to um, take a minute to address a couple of the questions that you the the committee members had brought up. Um, you know, obviously our department is intimately involved in investigations. Um, so to Representative Bailey's question about seeing hotlines, 
Um, hotlines are confidential. There are very specific out, specific um, carve outs in the law for when um, child abuse and neglect investigation, investigative records can be produced. It's only in cases of fatalities or near fatalities. And with regard to these facilities or, or any facility, there is a specific provision where the nature and disposition of a finding can be made. So um, while there has been reporting in the STAR regarding findings, substantiated findings, um, the department would not be able to discuss any investigations where findings had not been able to be made. And that really leads me into the other point I wanted to discuss, which um, to the chairwoman's question regarding um, where is the breakdown? Why are these, like, what is the issue? We know that these things are happening. Um, what, what, you, what we found in these facilities is a culture of restricted access. The department um, can't force a, a facility to produce a child. If you, um, as, as um, Marsha highlighted, you know, there are some mechanisms available to law enforcement, but if we can't see a child, we can't, we can't, we don't have evidence to go to the juvenile office um, to, to get them to remove a child. If you have law enforcement that um, is maybe feeling uncomfortable with, with using those mechanisms, mechanisms there, is no, there is no ability on the children's division part um, to force a facility or anyone to produce a child. And that's, I mean, that's been a pain point for a long time. And then even if we are able to see a child, um, as, as the testimony has, has been, you know, there are standards that we have to meet to make findings. And if you have children who are feel, fearful that they're gonna be sent back to these facilities, um, you see a lot of instances where kill, children might recant their stories. And even if they don't recant, if we don't have any evidence, if we don't have any physical evidence, which is, um, this is true both in investigations in facility settings and in home settings, it's very difficult to oftentimes to substantiate um, physical and of sexual abuse findings if disclosures are not made immediately because there is no physical evidence. And if you can't see kids, you also can't collect physical evidence. And then even if you make a finding, there's no mechanism in the law that has, there's no rep repercussions to that. There are no background checks at these facilities. Uh, individuals who have a finding made against them can go right back to work. There's no me mechanism to shut down these facilities, even if they're employing individuals who have felony convictions, um, who have findings uh, made against them for child abuse in this state or any other. So um, there are a lot of systemic breakdowns happening that are cumulative, cumulatively resulting in children being abused. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions of this witness? Vice Chair Bailey, please proceed. Thank you, just uh, real quick. So I I'm gonna push back a little bit. Um, I agree with the chairman, abuse is abuse. And okay, I may not be able to see the, um, the hotline numbers, but I certainly can subpoena them through the speaker's office. Because now if, because here's my problem. You're gonna push it back on the legislature, it's our fault. I'm calling you out on that. If you knew this was going on, you should somebody should from your department should have come to one of the legislators or senator uh, legislators or senators and said, "Hey, we've got a problem. We need to investigate." Not only is our job writing laws, but it's also investigating hearings, and we and we can keep things you know identifiable information private, but that's part of our job as well. I'm sitting up here a little steamed because I'm realizing the state has known about this, but it takes a Kansas City star to bring it to our attention. And now, well, it's the legislator's fault, legislature's fault because we haven't changed the law. Bull. You all knew, and you never came to anybody, and this has gone on I don't know how many years. So, yeah, we will get the law changed, but yeah, I will try for a subpoena and get that information because, you know, I'm sick of, I'm sick of the, the departments in this state saying, mm, sorry, we can't be held accountable. R just ridiculous. And the egregious things that are happening to these people, somebody needs to be accountable for it. Yeah, it's egg on our face because we haven't changed the law. I get that. But abuse is abuse. And if you all knew about this and didn't come to any of us, there's 163 in the House and 30-something in the Senate, 
God knows you could find somebody like me that will dig and dig and get every subpoena I need to find out what's going on. So, thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Bailey. Are there any other questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you for testifying. Representatives Fee and Ingle, we are scheduled to be on the floor right now, so I... Okay, please. I, we've heard a lot today. Um, I first want to thank the witnesses behind me who've traveled from across the country to be here to tell you their stories. But I want you all to know that since September, for every one of the witnesses out in the, in, in the audience, I've received a dozen more per witness that have contacted me personally via email or phone call to tell me their story. This is currently happening. We're past due. We understand that this bill could go a lot further. This is a jumping off point. I'm happy to speak with you, with any of you further if um, this is arguably the most important thing that this committee will do all year. So thank you for hearing us. I just want to, I just want to point out that what this bill does is give the prosecutors and them access to the children. You have to realize these are children come from some other state. If a home thinks there's an investigation, they can ship the kid back to Texas where it came from. And that was one of the things in talking to one of the prosecutors that said it's hard to get access to them. This bill does give a, a way to get access to these children. And then once you have access, you can take other steps. But until you get access to them, it's hard to do anything. And it, I'm not making an excuse for the prosecutor. But he said, you know, we get these complaints and the child is gone. There's nobody. And by then they're home and their parents don't want to get involved. And they're running up against block walls. Now, it's not an excuse, but this bill does give them the right to get access to this child so they can have access to the child and start the ball rolling. Until you get access, it's hard to do anything. And that's one of the things that the first part of this bill we do is get access. It's not unfeathered access, but it is a way to get access. Again, I thank you all for your time and, and for listening to this because these people have come a long way and they do have a sad story, or a very troubling story. And more importantly, it is our obligation here. And this is not, and there were some comments made about individual religions. We're not about any particular religion. I don't believe that any particular religion is more at fault than others. And it's just that we want to get something done to correct the situation. Thank you, Representative. This concludes the hearings on House Bill 557 and 560 and adjourns the Committee on Children and Families. Thank you. Thank you.